um, Martin Figueroa, who is a Brower Award winner, and his um, emphasis is also water, and um, we're going to um, have him introduce himself later. And next is Barbara Jefferson. And Barbara is from a wonderful group called Generation Waking Up. So if any of you try and fall asleep, Barbara will poke you. <laughs> um, and there's Maya Salcedo. And Maya is also a Brower Award winner. And Maya was our um, actually our uh, keynote speaker last year. So we're, it's wonderful that she's back. And last but not least is Tyrone Mullins who you'll see, if you're gonna go see Green Streets uh, later on, you will see Tyrone because he is the founder of Green Streets in Oakland. I'm completely happy to be here. Um, like John said, I, I work for about um, six years on the Skelma Revolutionary Optimist, which is about a, a group of activists in Calcutta, um, Kolkata, India, um, who are all between the ages of about 12 and 18, um, who over the course of the years that we filmed them, um, managed to get the first clean drinking water line delivered to their community and um, brought up the polio vaccination rates in their community from 40 to 80 percent and accomplished all kinds of things that a lot of the leading adults working in um, NGOs in those areas really thought were, were literally impossible to accomplish. Um, I met a guy who was one of the um, uh, top drinking water uh, people in the world. It's never gonna happen there. It's mafia run, there's too much violence, it's, it's impossible to get the government to bring drinking water there. But these youth, because they knew the community, managed to mobilize the adults in the community and they managed to um, play the political parties off of each other in a really sophisticated manner, and they got a drinking water line. So, um, so all of that makes me incredibly excited to be here with, um, with all of you um, who are at the forefront of making change in our own communities. Um, and I really am excited to kind of delve a little bit um, more deeply with you all into what um, and a role youth can play in the environmental movement and why um, that's important and, and why it can also be um, a really wonderful thing for, for you. So I thought it would be great to start off by having you um, introduce yourselves in a, in a deeper way and talk about um, your story from the perspective of um, what was it that motivated you to want to do what you do. Describe what you do, but talk about um, what, what was it that you saw and what was it that you experienced that, um, that really gave you the motivation to try to make change? We can just start with you, Martin. Sure. Hello. All right, uh, my name is Martin and I, uh, I'm from East Merced, uh, studying biology and finishing up my undergrad. And uh, I grew up in Los Angeles and as you guys all know, Los Angeles is known for their bad air quality, pollution, traffic, and so much uh, waste of water. So uh, I decided to go to UC Merced, one of the brand new uh, universities of the UC system. And at that time, it was known as the most uh, sustainable campus uh, in California. So all of its buildings are LEED certified and they're built from sustainably and they operate sustainably. So when I got there, I saw the total opposite. Uh, the buildings were not operating sustainably, lights were on during the day, water was wasted. And uh, Merced is in between Fresno and Stockton, so much of the farming, agriculture, and it's really dry, so water is really important. And I felt that it was, there was a need for change, there was a need for education, there was a need for people to be aware about the current water issues that are happening. And I'm sure most of you guys know uh, what's happening with water in California now, where we started a really bad year. Uh, and fairly dry year, so. Uh, so then I decided to take on that challenge and educate my peers, educate my campus about water conservation. And I developed a real-time uh, water monitoring device that allows students to see their water usage real-time. So when you turn on the faucet, 
you can actually see how much water is being used through an iPhone app, Android app, a dashboard through a website and stuff like that. So uh, with that technology, we took it a step further and we develop a competition among the residence halls. And uh, we saved 90,000 gallons of water that first year that we did it. So it was a success and we still do it every year. We're bringing up different campuses from across California and uh, yeah, we're really excited to grow even more. So just making people aware of water conservation, that's our goal. So awesome. Y'all awake out there? Y'all awake out there? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, my name is Barbara, and I work with uh, Generation Waking Up. How many of y'all heard of Generation Waking Up? All right. Well, that means all of you need to go into the tabling room and go check it out. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it throughout our time today, but a little bit about myself. I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Y'all familiar with Seattle? Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a rainy city up there. I grew up there, and as a young person, I was super engaged. Like, my dad, at a very young age, taught me that the way to live a happy life was to be engaged. So I played basketball. I wasn't very good at soccer, so I quit that. But I was in clubs, drama, honors, all, all of these things. Bright little kid, right? But as I started to get a little bit older into my teenage years, I started to be really impacted by the issues that surrounded me and that were so present in my family. So issues from addiction to violence to, to health issues, issues of oppression in my community, racism, all sorts of things. And the more that I started to recognize what was really happening and pay attention, the harder it was for me to just be like the chipper old kid and it was because I didn't really know what to do about it. There wasn't really anybody around giving me solutions to how I can make an impact in my family or how I can make an impact at school in the ways that I really wanted to. So for a while, I was just coping. Like I was just like any other young person, partying, kicking it, doing my own thing, but really trying to avoid as much as possible the problems that I was aware of. And when I came into contact with this organization, Generation Waking Up, it was my first time having similar opportunity to what you have, where I was in a room of young people who cared. And not only did they care, but they wanted to do something about it. And no one had the solutions or all of the solutions, but we were there because we had a commitment. And since then, I have just felt this amazing motivation to work with other peers of mine or other adults in the community to create projects that actually make lasting change. So I'm really excited to be here today um, to also answer part of your question of like, what was, what was the thing? Um, uh, I started taking this class. I thought I wanted to be a chef. Uh, and I, I cook really good, but I'm definitely not going to going to open a restaurant anytime soon. But I thought I wanted to be a chef, so I started studying nutrition, and in this class I started to learn about the reality of the food system, and the food industry, and food politics, and I learned that the food pyramid was actually not about the foods that were healthy for us. And this simple thing, this pyramid, like devastated me, because it was this thing that I had been taught since I was kindergarten. How many of y'all seen the food pyramid? Right? We're all taught the food pyramid, right? And I was like, that's what they taught me to eat, right? But I actually learned that this food pyramid had a lot to do with all the health issues that I saw in my family. And when my grandfather passed away from diabetes, it was a big wake up call for me. So I started to pursue just more education and I left the country and, and lived on some farms for a while and learned a lot more about how to live sustainably, about what it means to live healthy, happy, fulfilling lives, and the fact that I could do it. Like in our communities, in our families, we can actually create systems, healthy systems of eating and living. So that was a big uh, wake up for me. So I'm excited to be here, y'all. Thank you for having me. Oh. Blue mic in the house. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Maya. Um, I'm 21, and I started with the organization that I work with called Rooted in Community. Um, in 2008, so I was in high school then, um, and I wanted to share a bit about my story with you. It's kind of interesting hearing Barbara's story. I feel like a lot of it resonates with me um, because for me it started kind of at home with my family as well. 
Um, I grew up in a household with a single mother in Santa Cruz. I don't know if y'all know about Santa Cruz. Who knows about Santa Cruz? Yeah. So Santa Cruz is like known for being like a hippie town. It's known for like people who like to eat granola and all sorts of healthy food. But my family, like we were low income and we ate a lot of fast food. And so for me, I felt some shame sometimes when people would be like, oh, I've never had Taco Bell in my life, you know? And I'm like, oh, like that's what I eat often. So I felt weird, like, you know, I didn't have access to having, like to go out and surf, like a lot of my friends, cause I couldn't afford a surfboard. You know, I didn't have access to go out camping cause you know, my mom couldn't afford to take off time from work. I didn't have access to go eat the beautiful, healthy food that's grown right in Santa Cruz because, you know, we couldn't really afford to do that. Um, and my mom didn't feel like, because she was working, like, she actually worked in a restaurant, which is really funny, a farm-to-table restaurant, so they were growing food in the back of the restaurant, and she was feeding people food straight out the ground. And then she'd come home after cooking for everybody else and feel tired, and so we ate a lot of fast food, a lot of convenient stuff like Top Ramen. And so I felt like, wow, it's weird, all these people who have money are going to this restaurant my mom works at, and she's feeding them really great, but then at the end of the day, she doesn't have enough left to feed my family. And I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me, so he's in elementary school, and he's diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, and so I know for him that w when he hasn't had like the proper nutrition, right, if he's eating a bunch of stuff that, like starches that just give him a sugar rush, if he's eating, you know, like soda and stuff like that, that it, it makes it even harder for him to succeed. And I had the same experiences when I was growing up, you know, I felt kind of insecure about my body image because when I was growing up, I, you know, was rounder because I was eating unhealthy. I didn't know, you know, and my mom was giving me these foods that it's like, why would my mom give me this food that she knows is bad, right? My mom was a chef. She had nutrition education classes. Why would she give me food that's bad? And I realized, like, it w my mom didn't have a choice. I realized it wasn't until I had an opportunity to learn about the food system, what Barbara was talking about, the way that fast food corporations market to children so that it's an argument between moms and kids about what they're going to eat. The fast food restaurants, you know, it's way cheaper to get a burger than it is to go to the store and get all the stuff to make a meal. Often, you know, if you've got to get fresh produce and stuff like that, for a lot of people, it's hard to, to learn how to make it cheap to eat good and make it time efficient to eat good. And so my mom hadn't learned those skills. And so we were eating unhealthy. And I realized that, you know, it's because these corporations really control our food system. My, these corporations had way more control over what I was eating than my mom did, is what I realized. And I wanted to make a change in that. Because I didn't want to see other people growing up, you know, like me, growing up with not access to, to choose what they want to eat. Not an opportunity to learn how to prepare and buy food that is good for you. Um, and so... I wanted to change that, and I, that was in high school that I got, I went to this high school, like, after school farm for youth, and they taught me about the food system, and it was like this one day we were playing this fast food Jeopardy game, I was like, oh my god, it all hit me, like, I didn't realize that I was affected by these corporations having control of the food system, I didn't even realize that my own family was what I call food insecure, and now I know, now I know have a word for it, I didn't realize that before, I just thought that was normal, and I realized, I, it really upset me when I realized that what I thought was normal, what I was putting up with, this depression I was putting up with, I realized I could change. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna take action. I'm gonna do something about it. And so since then I've been working to change the food system with this national organization um, of high school youth who are doing that, high school youth who have stories like me. Um, and that's what I've, what I've been a part of. Um, and, and for me, it was all about justice. Um, and it was all about like making justice for people of color and for low-income people so that we have access to enjoy the natural beauty of this world, which includes healthy food and going out in the forest and going out and going surfing. So that's me. What's up, guys? Uh, um, here on, I'm Tyrone Monk, obviously. I'm here on behalf of a company called Green Streets. Hopefully, many of you will get the opportunity to see the film we're showing about 30 minutes or so. Um, this is my second opportunity to be able to come out here and just before I get to speaking, just to say this is a very humbling experience to be able to come and speak with the youth, especially coming from like the road that I come from. Um, I'm here on behalf of Green Streets, and we do recycling and composting and low-income housing. We uh, job innovation and just about um, the opportunity to change. Um, to get in my story a little bit, um, kind of traditional from where I come from. I'm from San Francisco. I'm from the Western Edition. We identify that as Fillmore. 
Um, went through some troubles growing up in low income housing and stuff, which led me to be incarcerated a few times. And it was, and going through that actually, and riding across this bridge again, it just, it brings it all back because usually I'm accustomed to passing that bridge and I'm going to San Quentin. So now, like, traveling and coming out here, it just it like brings everything full circle for me. Um, but it was in one of those trips that I just had the opportunity to meet some people who, um, who wasn't coming back home again, who had, who was just up under some different things and they was able to put some things in my head to kind of look at life a little differently as I returned back to society. When I came back, like the status that I have from that coming back to my neighborhood, 23, 24 years old, made me really popular. And instead of using that to kind of like influence some of the younger people minds in a certain way, it was like, let's, let's, let's do something with that because that's what, that's what the OGs taught me. And we was able to put this idea together around Green Streets, and it was just based on um, San Francisco has a zero waste initiative. And that basically says by 2020 that everything would be going in this proper receptacle. So living in low-income housing, we don't have any blue bins, no green bins. The trash rooms are filthy. It's just it's, it's a mess most of the time. And myself and those of you who will see the film will get to see DeMario. He actually lived in um, basically what, what we consider a rival neighborhood. But me and DeMario had went to high school together, was really cool throughout high school, but then over the, like the last 10 years hadn't really much interacted with each other based off of the division in the neighborhood. So the properties itself has a property on in his neighborhood, like his side and on my side, and they were doing some solar panel work. And they offered to work to the residents. And I took advantage of that. And DeMarle took advantage of that. And that was our first job opportunity. And it, it gave us the opportunity to be introduced to um, the, the green sector to, and to just be introduced to the to workforce. Like, we never worked before. I never had to show up on time for nothing except for court. So we did that. And we had an opportunity to sit down and talk with one of the people who um, was the head at the property and told him, you know, we want another job opportunity. We wanted to continue working. And we liked the way it felt to be able to have a job and to be able to have people see us and, and see us in a different kind of light. And he he said, well, we can put our heads together. Are you and DeMario willing to work with each other? And for me and him, that was a big challenge, not because we had any personal gripes, but because we had, we had lost so many people on his side and my side that nobody could ever foresee those two neighborhoods coming together. And it took a little minute, but me and Demo, as I call him now, um, was able to put our heads together and come up with this idea for uh we're going to say, you know Demo? Okay. <laughs> we had, but he he ended up bringing in a couple of his friends. I ended up bringing in a couple of my people. And we just really worked hard at being able to create the name, create the logo, create what our uniforms look like, put together um, what, a, what a mission statement was, what type of business we want to be. We're currently in the process of working on our legal structure. Um, and we went from that small idea to being able to have three sites in San Francisco, one in Richmond, and now we just signed a contract for uh, a site in Oakland. And the opportunities are like endless, especially in this type of work in, in a field where not too many people really have a great deal of knowledge about. You know, it's, it's new. If you're from the Bay Area, it's like green and some you know. But as you go out further past like the Bay Area, it's still fairly new. And we have conversations with people from Detroit, Atlanta, just all these different places where as this thing continues to grow, we got an opportunity to really impact some lives, especially just in a low income sector. And then as businessmen and women take this in and go into a commercial area with this and really make this a brand. Um, for me, it's the opportunity of being able to, to return because our employees work where they work where they live at. So our employees are coming out from low income housing apartments and cleaning up the area where they live at. And people see that and that makes a change in the neighborhood. Two, three years ago, when we was getting this ball rolling, how we impacted the community, you can actually see the results now. I can talk to the 10 year olds, the 12 year olds, the 14 year olds, and get them to pull their pants up, get them to get in the house a little bit. And for the most part, they listen to me because they know I, I've traveled that road that most people glorify and it's not too much glory in it. I wake up every day and I have um, I have a tattoo that has 10 people on my arm right here. And these people from my neighborhood, these people that I grew up with that I know, that I lost, you know what I mean? And I'm, 
through that, I'm able to see like it's a different way of going about this. It's a different way to impact life in general, and not just my life and the life that I come from, but all the different walks of life that we all come from. Wow. But um, one of the things that's so uh, really moving about all of you and what you're doing is that um, you are reaching out and educating other youth and bringing them into your work and using that as a means to empower community and, and transform lives. And, um, and I'm not sure that that's what you know, you, you, people might think of as environmental work. I think a lot of times when we think about people who are environmental activists, we imagine people going around and campaigning on behalf of animals or on behalf of wildlife. And, and here we're all really talking about um, people at the end of the day. You're talking about changing people's behavior. You're talking about um, you know, radicalizing a community to realize that it's oppressed and try to change systems that are oppressing it. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, about um, you know, that how you, I'm trying to think of how to formulate this into a question, but um, how you see your work as um, making change in people's um, perception of, of the political reality that they face and how you are um, you know, impacting the environment but also really changing people's lives. Anybody can start, yeah. My answer to that would be I don't look like a traditional businessman, and there's, there's no way you can tell me I'm not a businessman. <laughs> like, I wake up every day and I got a lot of business to handle. Yeah. Um, I think that's really cool because it, it gives an opportunity to like open people's eyes. I'm from San Francisco, so a lot of times I travel on public transportation and stuff like that. I still get the, um, the purse clutching, and people think I want to take their iPhone and all that other stuff. Like. I got an iPhone, I don't want to take your iPhone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's being able to um, come to places like this, come to some of the different events and some of the different um, areas, we've been able to engage with people and they get to understand that, that it's really, it's one world and we all got some type of story. You know what I mean? And if you can open your mind up enough, you can kind of like let some of these different ideas and some of, some of those old ideas kind of leave. In looking at uh, like a lot of the environmental issues that we see, it's impossible to separate any of them from humans. If we're talking about deforestation, then we're talking about the loss of clean air. And with the loss of clean air comes health issues, right? In our communities, asthma, cancer, that people are dealing with. When we look at the same issue from the other side, the people who desire to cut down those trees, you know, those are people. And that desire is usually connected with a lot of other people's desire, and often it's for money. And the idea of wealth, that's a human idea. So it's really impossible for us to separate ourselves from anything that's happening to the environment. And unfortunately, we have ourselves to blame for it. A lot of the environmental issues that we see, we have ourselves as human beings to blame. So a lot of the shift that happens has to start with the human beings, but with the things that drive us, our, our motivations and our values and our beliefs, our beliefs about the environment, that we can use it to our own discretion. Those are things that have to shift and so, in dealing with the environment, you're inevitably dealing with, with humans. Whether it's, it's trying to shift one group's impact on the environment or trying to save another group from being devastated by it. So, um, yeah, that's how, that's how I see that. That's great, yeah. Maya? Yeah, I like to jump in on this one too, and I'm gonna use kind of a funny example, so bear with me, but um, who saw the Blackfish movie? Yeah, okay, so would you say that those whales were maybe kind of oppressed? Would that be a, a fair word for that? Yeah, because they were kind of kept in cages, they were separated from their family, they weren't able to do the things that 
make whales happy when they live naturally the way they're supposed to live. Well, I was thinking about then what happened to the whales once they were oppressed like that. They got angry? And then people thought they were violent? Okay, so I think that a lot of the same systems that are used to oppress people are the same systems that we've used to oppress nature. Um, control and dominance by certain groups over others, that's kind of how we've done, that's what we've done to nature in a lot of ways. Certain, a small group of people control nature. They choose what forest gets chopped down. They choose, you know, um, what animals go where. You know, we build fences to keep animals from going places. So that's kind of control over nature. And I feel like that the same control has been exercised over people, you know, and so then people don't get to live the lives they want to live, and then they act out violently, maybe, to get the things they need to survive, maybe, you know, or because they're frustrated, because they, they're frustrated they're being, yeah, controlled, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I saw the connection between environment, co like colonialism of the environment, maybe, control, dominance by people over the environment. It's the same kind of dominance and, and same tools that are used to control people. And that's when I realized, like, oh, snap. Like, if we end this idea that only certain people are knowledge holders, then people, then there won't be certain people who control us, and there won't be certain people who control the planet, who control the animals. And so that's when I was like, yeah, youth, we are knowledge holders, right? So we don't need to be controlled. Uh, people of color, we are knowledge holders. We don't need to be controlled. And nature is a knowledge holder. Nature knows how to do its own thing. Those whales were doing the right thing before we put them in the tanks, right? So that's kind of where I was, like, realizing, drawing these connections between you know, our life experiences as people, and then the planet. And then, of course, right, we can't be separated from the planet. We live here. So that's when I realized, a deep, on a deeper level, like, oh, well, I'm kind of responsible for the planet, because I live here, and I eat from the planet, you know? So that's kind of where it, it, like, it took me first full circle. I realized we were having the same issues that animals and plants were having, and then I realized, oh, so we're also kind of on a team to, to correct this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a big shift that Barbara was talking about. Uh, just to add on that, I think oftentimes we uh, we wait to take action until it's too late, and in reality, that's what's happening now. Governor just announced a twenty percent reduction in water use per capita, and I, I see that more the government, politics, and all that stuff is getting involved within these important issues. Because believe it or not, there is no alternative for water, and that is one of the critical resources that we need to survive as humans. And oftentimes you'll see when we see a disaster or something like that, the first thing that people look for is water, clean drinking water. And just to add on that, I, I feel like we are too comfortable living the way that we're living now, that we're scared to change our behavior, to change our lifestyles. And fortunately, it's so simple and so easy that, you know, just twisting a couple of your uh, lifestyle, making a few changes can drastically change um, both your consumption, the way you live, and the way the environment operates, and how we're sustaining it. So, yeah. Um, you guys have all um, got a powerful story to tell, and I know that you must have had some obstacles and some struggles along the way because changing systems and fighting oppression is not easy. Um, so, I wonder if you could um, just each tell me a story about obstacles that you faced and how you overcame them. I think the biggest problem is getting college students to change and because simply living on campus a lot of people think oh I already paid for whatever I'm using and you know I can use how much I want to use and you can't tell me anything so just I think the biggest obstacle is getting people to change and believe what you're fighting for believe what you're uh, what you want them to know and uh, just again just believing in you I think that's the hardest obstacle uh, for me, it was hard getting administrators on my campus to get involved. It was hard to get staff to believe me that, you know, water is a critical issue. Water is important. They overcame it by uh, creating a group of students. And not only were they listening to just me, but a whole group of students and bringing the fact that, you know, we need change and we need to take action. Um, if I can speak to an obstacle, I would say the biggest obstacle is basically like the politics of the systems. Um, living in low-income housing, just getting people to, to take a look at the fact that we need to be treated fairly. Like we have the right to have a clean environment too and be able to come outside our house and then look clean. 
And even as we transitioned out of San Francisco, where San Francisco is really more innovative and, and up to speed with some of the new stuff that's going on, and moving over to Richmond, it was complicated. So mm -hmm. The structure is a little bit more difficult, even though we found out through research that Richmond has zero waste also, but they're just not up to speed with some of getting some of the things in place, some of the systems in place to change what's going on in those communities. So I think that's the biggest obstacle somebody actually wanted to change what's going on with, with those systems. Right, yeah. How do you how do you work to overcome that? Um just staying just staying motivated. Um when we've seen the results that, that's happened in such a short time at some of our properties, then we know that people are willing to listen. There are people out there who want to see change and it's places where change can be made. Right. Yeah. I think of a couple of things, um, both one obstacle that's exterior and another that's in, internal. Um, as I shared with, uh, earlier about growing up, just being super engaged and bright in school, I, in Seattle, Washington, there's a, an accelerated progress program. It's like AP classes, but uh, for younger students. And you have to test to get into this program, and I tested, and I tested higher than like 97% of the people who tested. And most people who were accepted in were in the like 80 to 90% percentile. So I was at the top, really. But they didn't let me in. And if it wasn't for my mother making phone calls, knocking on doors, sending let letters to figure it out, we would have never understood why. And when it came down to it, it was because I was black. And we had to fight with this school system. My mother, at the time, I was too young to really do much but be confused and sad, really. But my mother fought, calling people, meeting with different parents, you know, going to the school district and saying, no, I'm not accepting this. And after months of that, I was finally accepted into this program. And when I got in, there were only a handful of people of color in a program that was larger than this room, hundreds of students. So for me, a big obstacle is something that I have no control over, which is how people perceive me because of being a female, because of being black, or many other things. And that's something that I think started to cause a lot of my like apathy. Like, where I felt like it was cool not to care. It was like, there's all those prob problems out there. I can't do anything about them. So I'm just going to do me and not care. I'm going to, like, kick it with my friends and not talk about the things that actually really hurt my feelings because it's not cool to be sad. <laughs> it's cool to not care. So eventually, the biggest obstacle was that, was not caring. When it, when it came down to it, when I didn't feel motivated, it was because I felt paralyzed by issues because I was afraid of them. And whenever I felt fear, I would just push it away and not care. So I think um, the biggest thing now that I'm more in a space of wanting to confront issues and in, in a space of really wanting to make change, that's the issue that I feel is um, the biggest barrier in my community is that we're like, well, why? why? Why should we care? This has been happening to us our whole lives or our parents' lives. Not much change has happened, so, you know, why don't we just have a good time instead? Let's all just go to the movies instead or, you know, things like that. So that's really, yeah, or, or, or party. That was my biggest thing. Um, so, yeah. why you um, do the work you do to try to encourage other youth to be able to be engaged and take action because because of the kind of transformative power it has on an individual as well as a community level? What I've seen happen in my own life and in the lives of my friends or who are all like teens and 20s is that when we care and actually do something about it, we do make change. Mm -hmm. Like change actually does happen. Maybe not as fast as we want it to or as in large of a scale as we want it to, but everybody, every leader started with one small action at some point. And it grew into larger actions, into larger actions. So I do what I do because I've seen the transformation happen in my community. And I've seen my mother now composts and recycles. And, you know, I've seen my family change because of me doing things. So I just, I do this work to let everybody else know it's possible. 
It's, mm-hmm. it's possible for us to change those obstacles that are outside of us if we're able to overcome so, some of those obstacles inside of us. I wanted to briefly share something that I don't share often because a lot of the times I feel like it's an obstacle I came over and I didn't, um, and it's like an out so far away, it's not even present in my mind, but I actually had, I like, um, in middle school, I kind of similar to what Barbara was saying, like my teachers were telling me I was smart, I knew I was smart, but I was failing my classes because I wasn't doing my homework in middle school. And, um, and yeah, my teachers were like, we're so frustrated because you're obviously smart. And I would raise my hand in class and pay attention, but I just didn't do the work after school. I think because I just didn't care so much about the schoolwork, it didn't, there wasn't like, I didn't understand why I needed to do it, especially if I felt like I understood it, right? So I was like, why do I need to do the homework if I'm getting an A on the test? But apparently I needed to do the homework because I, I basically got kicked out of the school and I had to do alternative high school after that. And, um, and now I have two degrees. I just finished in December. And it was freaking hard all the way up until this like, December. Like, I was, like, crying in my house. Like, I can't do it. Like, I made it this far. Like, oh, my God. And, you know, I have a paper due in two hours. And I, like, didn't have any time to freaking start it. And I'm freaking out. And that was, it was a struggle. It was really, it really has been a battle up until December to finish school for me. And I do, I went to Mills College in Oakland. I recommend it for any of the women out there. Men can do it for grad school, too. Um, But, yeah, it was really hard for me to to apply myself in school. And I think it's because I couldn't find what I was passionate about. Then once I had an opportunity to make my schoolwork kind of about my passions, like about social justice and stuff like that, then, then I was like, I got it. It was still hard. But it was more motivation than I felt before when I didn't know why I was doing it. And so for me, school has been an obstacle. But um, so power to anybody out here who's working really hard. <laughs> I feel like high school students get like totally disrespected for the amount of hard work and how hard it is to apply yourself in school when you have a whole life outside of school. So more power to y'all and keep trying because it was a big obstacle for me. School, I don't know why it's like a deadline. It just doesn't work for me. But now, now I like I have a job. I'm cool. I made it, <laughs> which is so. Yeah, just want to share that. I think that um, a lot of times you feel connected to a cause in your community, or you can see something and think of some advice or um, some wisdom that you can share with people here who might be engaged in an issue or really want to start trying to do something. Um, what are some first steps you can take? How can you? Um, connect yourself to other organizations, other people, mentors, um, to, to try to take a step forward? I would say, first, education. Like, educate yourself on what it is that you want to get into. Make sure you're very knowledgeable about that area, that field. Um, taking advantage of resources, like she spoke of, just finding out who, who's into what you're into. What, what do they have going on? What, what sector does that fall in? Like we're doing green work, what's going on green this month in my city or cities close by? And then lastly is I would say um, like that drive, that passion, like the perseverance to understand that if this is something that you want, then you'll go get it. You know what I mean? And you might fall once, twice, maybe even three times, but as long as you continue to get up and, and pursue with the same kind of drive and the same kind of energy, then I think you'll ultimately be okay. To add to that, I would say um, find a passion, find an interest, what you're interested in, and stick with it. You know, a lot of times you're going to be challenged with, you know, obstacles, uh, people telling you that's not the right way to do it, you know, go the other way, make money, do this, do that. And I think the most important thing is just to stick with what you're passionate about and what your cost is or the issue that you might be interested in, and then just take it further, and you'll enjoy it. I mean, it's hard work, but it pays off at the end, so... One thing that I was kind of thinking about, too, is like that, right, what is this work? We keep talking about this work, get into this work, how do we get into this work, what is this work? Mm, I don't know, there's not, I don't have a good way to describe it other than it's stuff that's good for people and the planet, right? Okay? What we do, how we do that work is totally up to us, and I feel like we have a perfect example over here of what that means, right? Like, she's, she's not writing reports to Congress, right? She's not, um you know, writing law, she's not a lawmaker, she's not up here speaking like me, she's not in a classroom teaching people, she's doing what she likes to do, draw. And that's how she's making an impact. 
And so I think for a lot of us, it's, it's up to us to kind of figure out what's inside, what things make are exciting for us. Like, that's, my, that's what I learned about school. I had to figure out what made me excited about to do it. And I feel like it's like kind of take a second to think about what things you like to do already and then see how you can apply your skills or talents to issues that you care about, right? So if you like to play sports, then like maybe your, tr your goal or job in this work is to find other athletes who care about important things, who want to use their spotlight to, to highlight issues, right? Or if you like music, maybe your job is to make the soundtrack to our new world, right? Maybe your job is to make music that awakens and inspires people. Because I love the music on the radio, right? That's fun. But, and I like conscious music. Also, I think there's a lot of room for people to make conscious music that's actually you can dance to. Because there's a lot of lack of that. It's like, cool words, but not exciting music, right? So if you like music, there's a job for you. If you like to draw, there's a job for you. If you're into numbers and business, if you want to make money, if you think you want to be an entrepreneur, you come to me because I need to find someone to do a business plan for my job, okay? So that's what I'm saying. It's like find out whatever it is that you're interested in. That's a really great place to start is just think about you because if it's not real to you, then it's not going to work. Um, so we just have a few minutes left and I want to do two things. Um, First of all, so Barbara is a great facilitator, and she suggested a question um, when we were talking before the panel, um, which I'm now going to throw back at all of you, which is if you had a megaphone and you had 15 seconds to say one thing to the world, what would you say? And you guys can think about that for a second. And I want all of you to turn to someone sitting next to you and say to the other person the one thing that you would really like to change in the world, if you could take action, if you could do one thing to improve the world as you see it, what is the issue that you feel passionate about that you would want to change? So let's, let's do that now. Okay, guys, I, I hope that you will continue this discussion um, at some point today. And I wonder if there's one or two people who want to share what they said with, with all of us. Anybody? What do you want to change? <laughs> okay, well, I'll ask again at the end, but why don't we um, give these guys the megaphone. So you have 15 seconds, each of you, and uh, we'll start with you. Um. Never forget to believe. Never forget to believe in yourself. Never forget to believe in change. And never forget to believe in life. Those of us who have firsthand experience about what's not working right now, we have the best tools to change that. So youth are ready to take over. Adults give us opportunities. Because um, we got this, and we're excited, and we're going to do it better than the generation before us. <laughs> Speaking of facilitation, what I have to say is actually instructions. So close your eyes, or lower them if you're comfortable with that. And forget about what everyone has told you. Forget about what people say is right or wrong. In fact, just get out of your head for a moment, and I just want you to... Connect with your heartbeat. Pay attention to your heart that's beating in your chest right now. And I want you to think, if there was nothing that could stop you, if there was no chance that you could fail, what would you do? That is the most important thing. Right there, what your heart says to answer that question. I would say uh, you guys are the change you guys want to see, and you guys are the leaders for tomorrow, and I think you get, we need to start getting involved with all these important issues like water, like climate change, CO2, and 
recycling, composting, and it is your job now to take that to your communities and your families and make an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and listening. And I'm hoping that we can hear some of what you guys want to make change on um, later on today. Thank you. imagine people going around and campaigning on behalf of animals or on behalf of wildlife and and here we're all really talking about um, people at the end of the day you're talking about changing people's behavior you're talking about um, you know radicalizing a community to realize that it's oppressed and try to change systems that are oppressing it um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that about um, you know that how you trying to think of how to formulate this into a question, but um, how you see your work as um, making change in people's um, perception of, of the political reality that they face, and how you are um, you know, impacting the environment, but also really changing people's lives. Anybody can start, yeah. My answer to that would be, I don't look like a traditional businessman, and it's, it's no way you can tell me I'm not a businessman. Like, I wake up every day, I got a lot of business to handle. Um, I think that's really cool, because it, it gives an opportunity to like open people's eyes. I'm from San Francisco, so a lot of times I travel on public transportation and stuff like that. I still get the, um, the purse clutching, and people think I want to take their iPhone and all that other stuff. Like, I got an iPhone, I don't want to take your iPhone. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's being able to um, come to places like this, come to some of the different events and some of the different um, areas, we've been able to engage with people. And they get to understand that, that it's really just one world. And we all got some type of story. You know what I mean? And if you can open your mind up enough, you can kind of like let some of these different ideas and some of, some of those old ideas kind of leave. In looking at uh, like a lot of the environmental issues that we see, it's impossible to separate any of them from humans. If we're talking about deforestation, then we're talking about the loss of clean air. And with the loss of clean air comes health issues, right? In our communities, asthma, cancer, that people are dealing with. When we look at the same issue from the other side, the people who desire to cut down those trees, you know, those are people. And that desire is usually connected with a lot of other people's desire, and often it's for money. And the idea of wealth, that's a human idea. So it's really impossible for us to separate ourselves from anything that's happening to the environment. And unfortunately, we have ourselves to blame for it. A lot of the environmental issues that we see, we have ourselves as human beings to blame. So a lot of the shift that happens has to start with the human beings, but with the things that drive us, our, our motivations and our values and our beliefs, our beliefs about the environment, that we can use it to our own discretion. Those are things that have to shift, and so in dealing with the environment, you're inevitably dealing with, with humans. Whether it's, it's trying to shift one group's impact on the environment, or trying to save another group from being devastated by it. So, um, yeah, that's how, that's how I see that. Yeah. I'd like to jump in on this one too, and I'm gonna use kind of a funny example, so bear with me, but um, who saw the Blackfish movie? Yeah? Okay, so would you say that those whales were made kind of oppressed? Would that be a, a fair word for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they were kind of kept in cages, they were separated from their family, they weren't able to do the things that make whales happy when they live naturally the way they're supposed to live. Well, I was thinking about then what happened to the whales once they were oppressed like that. They got angry. They got angry? Yeah. And then people thought they were violent? 
Okay, so I think that a lot of the same systems that are used to oppress people are the same systems that we've used to oppress nature. Um, control and dominance by certain groups over others, that's kind of how we've done, that's what we've done to nature in a lot of ways. Certain, a small group of people control nature. They choose what forest gets chopped down. They choose, you know, um, what animals go where. You know, we build fences to the animals from going places. So that's kind of control over nature. And I feel like that the same control has been exercised over people, you know, and so then people don't get to live the lives they want to live, and then they act out violently, maybe, to get the things they need to survive, maybe, you know, or because they're frustrated, because they, they're frustrated they're being, yeah, controlled, right? So for me, I saw the connection between environment, co like colonialism of the environment, maybe, control dominance by people over the environment. It's the same kind of dominance and, and same tools that are used to control people. And that's when I realized, like, oh, snap. Like, if we end this idea that only certain people are knowledge holders, then people, then there won't be certain people who control us, and there won't be certain people who control the plant, who control the animals. And so that's when I was like, yeah, youth, we are knowledge holders, right? So we don't need to be controlled. Uh, people of color, we are knowledge holders. We don't need to be controlled. And nature is a knowledge holder. Nature knows how to do its own thing. Those whales were doing the right thing before we put them in the tanks, right? So that's kind of where I was, like, realizing, drawing these connections between you know, our life experiences as people, and then the planet. So we're also Wait, kind of on a team to, to correct this. And um, I think that's a big shift that Barbara was talking about. Uh, just to add on that, I think oftentimes we, uh, we wait to take action until it's too late. And in reality, that's what's happening now. Governor just announced a 20% reduction in water use per capita. And I, I see that more the government politics and all that stuff is getting involved within these important issues because believe it or not there is no alternative for water and that is one of the critical resources that we need to survive as humans and oftentimes you'll see when we see a disaster or something like that the first thing that people look for is water clean drinking water and just to add on that I, I feel like we are too comfortable living the way that we're living now that we're scared to change our behavior to change our lifestyles and Fortunately, it's so simple and so easy that you know just twisting a couple of your uh, lifestyle, making a few changes can drastically change uh, both your consumption, the way you live, and the way the environment operates and how we're sustaining it. So, yeah. um, you guys have all um, got a powerful story to tell, and I uh, know that you must have had some obstacles and some struggles along the way because changing systems and fighting oppression is not easy. Um, so I wonder if you could um, just each tell me a story about obstacles that you faced and how you overcame them. I think the biggest problem is getting college students to change and because simply living on campus, a lot of people think, oh, I already paid for whatever I'm using and you know I can use how much I want to use and you can't tell me anything so just I think the biggest obstacle is getting people to change and believe what you're fighting for believe what you're uh, what you want them to know and uh, just again just believing in you I think that's the hardest obstacle uh, for me it was hard getting administrators on my campus to get involved it was hard to get staff to believe me that you know water is a critical issue water is important and you know i overcame it by uh creating a group of students and not only were they listening to just me but a whole group of students and bringing the fact that you know we need change and we need to take action so um if i can speak to an obstacle i would say the biggest obstacle is basically like the politics of the systems, um, limited low income housing, just getting people to, to take a look at it, the fact that we need to be treated fairly. Like if we have the right to have a clean environment, so we would be able to come outside our house and it looks clean. And even as we transition out of San Francisco, mm -hmm. San Francisco is really more innovative and out of the some of the new stuff that's going on. And you know, in Richmond, it was complicated. Even though we found out the research that Richmond had to go it's also that they're just not up to speed to some of the things in place and the systems in place to change what's going on across the world. So I think that's the biggest obstacle. Somebody actually wanted to change what's going on with those systems. Yeah. Yeah. How did you overcome that? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that's a great question. 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 I think that's a great
Yeah. Um, just staying, just staying motivated. Um, when we seen the results that that's happened in such a short time at some of our properties, then we know that people were willing to listen. There are people out there who want to see change, and it's places where change can be made. Mm -hmm. I think I have a couple of things. Um, both one obstacle that's exterior and another that's in, internal. Um, as I shared uh, earlier about growing up just being super engaged and bright in school, I, in Seattle, Washington, there's a, an accelerated progress program. It's like AP classes, but uh, for younger students. And you have to test to get into this program, and I tested and I tested higher than like 97% of the people who tested. And most people who were accepted in were in the like 80 to 90% percentile. So I was at the top, really. But they didn't let me in. And if it wasn't for my mother making phone calls, knocking on doors, sending letters to figure it out, we would have never understood why. And when it came down to it, it was because I was black. And we had a fight with this school system. My mother, at the time, I was too young to really do much but be confused and sad, really. But my mother fought, calling people, meeting with different parents, you know, going to the school district and saying, no, I'm not accepting this. And after months of that, I was finally accepted into this program. And when I got in, there were only a handful of people of color in a program that was larger than this room, hundreds of students. So for me, a big obstacle is something that I have no control over, which is how people perceive me because of being a female, because of being black, or many other things. And that's something that I think started to cause a lot of my like apathy. Like, it, where I felt like it was cool not to care. It was like, there's all those prob problems out there. I can't do anything about them, so I'm just going to do me and not care. I'm going to, like, kick it with my friends and not talk about the things that actually really hurt my feelings because it's not cool to be sad. <laughs> it's cool to not care. So eventually, the biggest obstacle was that, was not caring. When it, when it came down to it, when I didn't feel motivated, it was because I felt paralyzed by issues because I was afraid of them. And whenever I felt fear, I just push it away and not care. So I think um, the biggest thing now that I'm more in a space of wanting to confront issues and in, in a space of really wanting to make change, that's the issue that I feel is um, the biggest barrier in my community is that we're like, well, why? why? Why should we care? This has been happening to us our whole lives or our parents' lives. Not much change has happened, so, you know, why don't we just have a good time instead? Let's all just go to the movies instead, or, you know, things like that. So that's really, yeah, or, or, or party. That was my biggest thing. Um, so, so, yeah. What do you um, do the work you do to try to encourage other youth to be able to be engaged and take action because, because of the kind of transformative power it has on an individual as well as at a community level? What I've seen happen in my own life and in the lives of my friends, or who are all like teens and 20s, is that when we care and actually do something about it, we do make change. Like, change actually does happen. Maybe not as fast as we wanted to, or as in large of a scale as we wanted to, but everybody, every leader started with one small action at some point, and it grew into larger actions, into larger actions. So I do what I do because I've seen the transformation happen in my community, and I've seen my mother now composts and recycles, and, you know, I've seen my family change because of me. Doing things. So I just, well, I do this work to let everybody else know it's possible. It's, it's possible for us to change those obstacles that are outside of us if we're able to overcome so, some of those obstacles inside of us. I wanted to briefly share something that I don't share often because a lot of the times I feel like it's an obstacle I came over and I didn't, um, and it's like, and not so far away, it's going to be present in my mind, but actually had, I like, um, in middle school, I kind of similar to what Barbara was saying, like my teachers were telling me I was smart, I knew I was smart, but I was failing my classes because I wasn't doing my homework in middle school. And um, 
And yeah, my teachers were like, we're so frustrated because you're obviously smart and I would raise my hand in class and pay attention, but I just didn't do the work after school. I think because I just didn't care so much about the schoolwork, it didn't, there wasn't like, I didn't understand why I needed to do it, especially if I felt like I understood it, right? So I was like, why do I need to do the homework? I'm gonna get an A on the test. But apparently I needed to do the homework because I, I basically got kicked out of the school and I had to do alternative high school after that. And, um, and now I have two degrees. I just finished in December. And it was freaking hard all the way up until this last December. Like, I was like crying in my house. Like, I can't do it. Like, I made it this far. Like, oh my God. And, you know, I have a paper due in two hours and I like didn't have any time to freaking start it. And I'm freaking out. And that was, it was a struggle, it was really, it really has been a battle up until December to finish school for me. And I do, I went to Girls College in Oakland. I recommend it for any of the women out there. Men can do it for grad school too. Um, but yeah, it was really hard for me to, to find myself in school. And I think it's because I couldn't find what I was passionate about. Then once I had an opportunity to make my school work kind of about my passions, like about social justice and stuff like that, then, then I was like, I got it. It was still hard. But it was more motivation than I felt before when I didn't know why I was doing it. And so for me, school has been an obstacle. But um, so power to anybody out there who's working really hard. <laughs> I feel like high school students get like totally disrespected for the amount of hard work and how hard it is to apply yourself in school when you have a whole life outside of school. So more power to y'all and keep trying because it was a big obstacle for me. School, I don't know why it's like a deadline. It just doesn't work for me. But now, now I like I have a job. I'm cool. I made it. <laughs> Which is, um, yeah. A lot of times you feel connected to a cause in your community, or you can see something in the community that you want to make change, but you feel like the the obstacles are too great, and you don't know where to start. So I wonder, since you all work with you, I wonder if you can just think of some advice or. Um, some wisdom that you can share with people here who might be engaged in an issue or really want to start trying to do something. Um, what are some first steps you can take? How can you um, connect yourself to other organizations, other people, mentors, um, to, to try to take a step forward? I would say, first, education. Like, educate yourself on what it is that you want to get into. Make sure you're very knowledgeable about that area, that field. Um, taking advantage of resources, like she spoke of, just finding out who, who's into what you're into, what, what do they have going on, what, what sector does that form. Like, we're doing green work, what's going on, bring this month in my city or cities close by. And then, lastly, it's, I would say, um, like that drive, that passion, like, for perseverance to understand that if this is something that you want, then you'll go get it. You know what I mean? And you might fall once, twice, maybe even three times, but as long as you continue to get up and, and pursue with the same kind of drive and the same kind of energy, then I think you'll ultimately be okay. To add to that, I would say uh, find a passion, find an interest, what you're interested in, and stick with it. You know, a lot of times you're going to be challenged with, you know, obstacles. Uh, people telling you that's not the right way to do it, you know, go the other way, make money, do this, do that. And I think the most important thing is just to stick with what you're passionate about and what your cause is or your, the issue that you might be interested in and then just take it further and you'll enjoy it. I mean, it's hard work, but it pays off at the end, so. One thing that I was kind of thinking about too is like that Right, what is this work? We keep talking about this work, get into this work, how do we get into this work? What is this work? Mm, I don't know, there's not, I don't have a good way to describe it other than it's stuff that's good for people and the planet, right? Okay? What we do, how we do that work is totally up to us, and I feel like we have a perfect example over here of what that means, right? Like, she's, she's not writing reports to Congress, right? She's not, um, you know, writing laws, she's not a lawmaker, she's not up here speaking like me. She's not in a classroom teaching people, she's doing what she likes to do, draw. And that's how she's making an impact. And so I think for a lot of us, it's, it's up to us to kind of figure out what's inside, what things make are exciting for us. Like that's, my, that's what I learned about school. I had to figure out what made me excited about to do it. And I feel like it's like, kind of take a second to think about what things you like to do already, and then see how you can apply your skills or talents to issues that you care about, right? So if you like to play sports, then like maybe you're, you're goal or job in this work 
is to find other athletes who care about important things, who want to use their spotlight to, to highlight issues, right? Or if you like music, maybe your job is to make the soundtrack to our new world, right? Maybe your job is to make music that awakens and inspires people. Because I love the music on the radio, right? That's fun. But, and I like conscious music also. I think there's a lot of room for people to make conscious music that's actually you can dance to. Because there's a lot of lack of that. It's like cool words, but not exciting music, right? So if you like music, there's a job for you. If you like to draw, there's a job for you. If you're into numbers and business, if you want to make money, if you think you want to be an entrepreneur, you come to me because I need to find someone to do a business plan for my job, okay? So that's what I'm saying. It's like find out whatever it is that you're interested in. That's a really great place to start is just think about you. Because if it's not real to you, then it's not going to work. Um, so we just have a few minutes left, and I want to do two things. Um, first of all, so Barbara is a great facilitator, and she's.